Well, thank you, Anna, for such a lovely, nice, warm introduction and welcome. And uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, I did take the train up from Milan just to be here because I'm a fan from afar of this uh, arbitration school. I've been watching it over the last couple of years uh, and uh, wanted to be able to be part of it. So I'm really delighted to be here for that reason. Um, as a, one of the first lectures that you'll have, I chose a topic. Can you hear me all the way in the back? All right. So I chose a topic that, uh, of course, is near and dear to my heart, as Anna said, um, but it also is foundational. Um, I know that some of you are quite sophisticated. Anna gave a great, I think, overview of the, the range of uh, experiences and backgrounds uh, and perspectives that are in the audience. So I tried to pitch this so that everyone will be able to understand. And that, so even if you are really experienced, we'll challenge some of the assumptions you may have. Uh, and if you are not, uh, they'll give you at least also a base to think about uh, and a perspective for some of the topics you'll be learning uh, later in the week. So really simple question, what does independence mean? I like starting with this really simple question because we all think we know what it means. We all have a sort of fun, an intuition about what it means, okay? But the problem is whose independence are we talking about? Our arbitrators is what we're gonna talk about mostly today. Okay, but you know where else they use the word independence? Lawyers also have a duty to be independent. You know who else has a duty to be independent? And that's the same word that's used, expert witnesses. So we use this same word in three very different contexts. And so obviously the independence obligations of a lawyer cannot be the same as an arbitrator. And the independence obligations of an expert witness aren't the same as either the lawyer or the arbitrator, okay? Uh, so what I wanna do is just shake from you uh, any preconceived ideas you have about what independence necessarily means. Now, in international arbitration, we use the words independence and impartiality almost interchangeably. Um, there have, some people have parsed them linguistically and come up with different definitions that sort of separate or tease apart the two. In most rules that you study, they use the two together. And to the extent they can be parsed, I think it's a little bit of uh, a fool's errand because each word is so ambiguous. Um, the fact that you can kind of find some sunlight between the two doesn't help very much. Let me speak a couple of reasons why I think they're problematic. So we talked already that independence is used in various contexts, so that creates some level of ambiguity. Another problem with both these words is that they are essentially binary. You're either independent or you're dependent. You're either impartial or you're partial. But that is not how human beings are made, okay? And the underlying assumption when you have a binary, okay, is that these are effectively absolutes. But there is no such thing. It is not humanly possible, and I will go on to say not desirable, okay, to have absolute independence. So it's a little cut off from the chart here. Let me see if I can down. Uh, the bottom's a little cut off. I can't see it. It's okay. Uh, I'll tell you what it says there. Okay, so this is a chart, um, and it is going to, I think, hopefully help you understand how, how muddled the concept of independence is. So there's a famous saying by an American jurist, okay, that the law is what the judge ate for breakfast. What it aims to convey is that law is variable. There is no single one right answer to a particular case. And of course, backgrounds of the arbitrators or the judges, as he was referring to, uh, affect how they view a case, how they decide a case, uh, and how they uh, perceive facts even, um, how they understand what witness is saying, and of course, how they understand the law. But just to show you that how impossible impartiality and independence are, I'm going to explain to this chart for you. So basically, this is a chart of Israeli judges, okay? And this is judges all over the world, all over the world, in sentencing uh, as people who've been convicted, okay? And you can see they start out pretty generous, okay? This is kind of favorability of the decisions. They start with pretty generous sentences, and then they go down, and when do they come back up? After the judge has a snack. And then it declines again until the judge has lunch. 
And you can see he's really grumpy by the end of the day, or she, okay? Now, in other words, this, this, this judge, and this is particularly interesting because it's a very controlled sort of natural experiment. Sentencing is a relatively narrow set of criteria, and you have the same person making decisions throughout the day, okay? So it's relatively, there are not a lot of variables there. And so you can isolate um, this pattern uh, pretty easily. Um, now that is a disturbing pattern. Okay, so I like to say it's not what the judge ate for breakfast, it's when he takes or she takes a snack or when she has lunch. Okay, so human beings are simply not capable of being fully impartial or in independent, so to speak. But I also think that that's a false goal. We don't want them to be. We don't want them to be. That's why when we have special processes for determining who gets to be a judge or who gets to be an arbitrator. Okay, we don't have a lottery of all the lawyers who might be eligible, just pick one out. We actually think there's a process that needs to be gone through. It differs for judges in different jurisdictions around the world, okay? But it's usually thought out because we care about the fact that their identity, their background, their training will affect how they make decisions and if they get too hungry, okay? <laughs> um, now, to illustrate, I think, uh, how undesirable um, international arbitration would be if we said we could find a truly independent, absolutely independent arbitrator, okay? The only way to come up with something absolutely independent or impartial is to take the humanness out of it. Could you, could two parties, two sophisticated parties, agree to roll the dice and have the arbitration outcome decided based on a roll of the dice? <laughs> Intuitions, no, right? Anyone want to take the yes here? Okay. Oh, okay, in the back of the room. Uh, so I think you could, I actually think for various reasons it would not be legally enforceable. Okay. Why? Because it is contrary to the reasons we give legal effect to arbitral awards. Okay. It would be essentially agreeing in advance the outcome, even if you don't know what that outcome exactly is, and you can't agree in advance to an outcome of a dispute that hasn't arisen. Um, now, this becomes a relevant question because we are also talking about this in other places where, with regard to AI, uh, I think we're very, very far away from having uh, either lawyers completely replaced or arbitrators or judges replaced by artificial intelligence. Okay, But people, when they discuss it, they talk about it like it'd be this terrific thing, we'd get rid of all the biases. And we would have an entity, essentially a robot, who is perfectly, absolutely impartial and independent. Okay, um, but I don't think actually that that is really uh, what we mean and what we need. Excuse me. Okay. So now, um, keep walking down this road with me. Hopefully, I'll have you convinced by the end. That we don't necessarily want absolute impartiality or we can't have. So if you can't have absolute impartiality because it's impossible, then the question becomes uh, what forms of bias, and I put the word bias in quotation marks because it's a dirty word, okay? Uh, people act like it's you're either biased or you're unbiased. Okay, I have news for you, we're all biased. That's what I'm telling you when I say no, no such thing as absolute impartiality, meaning that we're all biased. Okay. So then the question becomes, which forms of bias are okay? Well, we know some that aren't. Racial bias, gender bias, okay? Some of those types of bias, ooh, we almost had a little bath there. Some of those types of bias are unacceptable, okay? Um, but there are more neutral and subtle questions about bias that we have to work ourselves through. I'm gonna just put this here so I don't take a shower in the middle of my talk. Um, and uh, so we can't just say, is there bias? We have to say, what kinds of bias okay, exists? And we have to ask, which ones are legitimate? Okay. Who decides which ones are legitimate? Let me give you one example. In terms of which bias is legitimate in the United States, if you've been following what's happening with the U.S. Supreme Court, maybe not a good example of legitimacy right now, but... You have very different ideas among Republicans and Democrats okay, about which forms of bias, which types, which perspectives in a judge make the best justices, which ones are the most legitimate. 
And who decides? Well, again, if you watch the not always uh, elegant process of nominating and confirming U.S. Supreme Court justices in the U.S. Senate. In international arbitration, which forms of bias are legitimate? And I'm gonna ask you to put away your, your idea that bias is a naughty word, a bad behavior. I'm talking more about the, the type of bias or the absence of an ability to be absolutely impartial, okay? Um, may, many of you have heard of cognitive biases. Are you familiar with that? These are the biases that exist even though we don't want them to. So for example, here's a really neutral one, but it's uh, active is we have something called hindsight bias. Right in the U.S., it's called Monday morning quarterbacking because the football games happen on Sunday, and Monday morning everyone has a perfect idea of exactly what should have happened, and they can't understand why the quarterback was so dumb that he didn't do that. Okay, um, we all are subject to this hindsight bias. Everything looks obvious to us in the past, and we are basically, as human beings, effectively a bundle of these biases of different types. Okay. So which forms of them are legitimate for decision-making in a, in a judicatory context? Who decides in, in courts? It's the governments. In international arbitration, directly or indirectly, it's the parties. When, even if they, for example, choose the, ask the institution to appoint the arbitrators, they are choosing the institution to appoint the arbitrators. Okay, so in, who decides is, in the particular case, the parties, okay? But more generally, it is the arbitration community as well. And then the part of this, this that I focus on with regard to ethics is how do we police the boundary between what is legitimate and illegitimate forms of bias? Now, this last question is really tricky because and where we started was we think we all know what independence means. We assume inherently that we think it's possible in the absolute. But once you take away those two assumptions, this becomes actually quite nuanced and tricky. So I have a theory about how we might decide okay, to create the boundaries, to draw the boundaries, and how we might decide to uh, regulate them. So my theory is that procedures in an adjudicatory context okay, determine what the role is of a moral actor, meaning whoever we're talking about, whether it's a judge or an arbitrator or an attorney or a witness, okay? And the procedures determine the role and the role determines at least the range of ethical conduct that would be legitimate. And if we can spell it out more clearly, we can also police the line between the two. We can say, well, this we know is legitimate, but this is not legitimate. If we just have it as a big concept, independent and impartial. It becomes very difficult to police the line. It also, those words don't help explain how those words can mean different things in different places. So for example, procedures for an expert witness, if there are tribunal appointed expert witness, they have actually very different, meaning the procedures are that they're appointed by the tribunal, very different role than if they're a party appointed expert. Okay, but once we know what they are doing, what that role is, we can say, okay, what conduct is appropriate? If they're party appointed, it's okay for them to meet with the party because that's where they get their information. And that's where the, the lawyers get the information they need to draft their briefs. But if it's a party appointed, excuse me, a tribunal appointed arbitrator in that role, meeting separately with the parties would be really inappropriate. Uh, and the same thing, I think, goes for arbitrators, okay? Uh, and I have a theory, uh, so you heard at the beginning, very nicely introduced, that there are a, a more than a few proposals to get rid of party-appointed arbitrators. And there is a long history of, I would say, bashing the party-appointed arbitrator. Uh, there is also some great, very colorful stories um, that have made this uh, this a, a sort of pastime for some. Uh, so in the US, Iran, in the Iran, US claims tribunal, uh, actually early in its life, uh, some Iranian appointed arbitrators physically attacked a Swedish arbitrator um, who was actually injured in the situation. Uh, there are numerous historical examples and even uh, troublingly, 
some really modern examples of party appointed arbitrators behaving in ways that are just really naughty. You know, they're just doing things that everybody thinks is awful. And so what has come to be said is party appointed arbitrators, the idea that they could ever be impartial is a farce. And farce seems to be the word that people have really settled on. It's a joke. They're of course they're not impartial. They can never be impartial. Why? Because they're picked by the parties. Okay. And why do the parties pick a, how do they decide which arbitrator to pick? Okay. There's actually a famous saying by a famous arbitrator, Martin Hunter, the optimal party appointed arbitrator is the arbitrator with maximum predisposition to my party and minimum appearance of bias. It sounds like a joke, but I don't think it is. I actually think it is a legitimate expression of the role of party appointed arbitrators. Okay. Um, and I'm going to take you through it hopefully by the end, even if you aren't fully convinced that party appointed arbitrators are not a farce and that we can define their impartiality obligations and evaluate them um, on those terms, uh, at least I'll get you thinking about it because this, these topics will come up later in the week um, as Anna introduced. So remember we said procedures determine the role, determine the ethical obligation. So here we have a sort of combination of procedures, okay, um, that are, you can also kind of discern what the role is of the chairperson from these kind of procedures. Some of them are more practice norms than written procedures, but for example, chairpersons can issue as an individual, not as a tribunal, interlocutory orders. Okay, they don't need to necessarily consult the co-arbitrators. Chairpersons have a special role. They can also fix time limits and grant extensions without consulting or getting the agreement of the party appointed arbitrators. They can also sign awards on behalf of the entire tribunal. Okay. Now, hopefully you're asking yourself, would you be comfortable with a party appointed arbitrator doing any of these independently on their own? Probably not, okay? Um, but what these spell out is that we do have in our minds that party appointed arbitrators do not have, even if they're appointed, uh, you know, uh, through different methods, so there are different methods for appointing them, I won't go into, um, but the wing arbitrators, right? So these rules apply both to wing arbitrators who might be appointed by institutions and party appointed arbitrators. In other words, these are special features special procedures that apply only to the chairperson. They can, they typically prepare initial drafts, although not always, they can assign them out to others, but it's the chair who makes the assignment, okay? Um, interestingly, the chairperson, and this is more of a, a norm, a practice norm, typically makes the uh, logistical arrangements. Where are the hearings gonna happen? Why would you want the party appointed arbitrator to do that? I'm going to continue with my sports analogy, right? You don't want one of the two side arbitrators to give one party a home court advantage, right? To decide that it would be more convenient for one party than the other. The chairperson, of course, we know presides over hearings. Uh, in uh, the, They prepare the initial draft, but they can also delegate it to the other arbitrators. And one practice point that I found in a an article talking about how what is the role of the chairperson is that one of the things they are supposed to do is monitor the balance between the two party appointed arbitrators. Okay, if we think that they have a sort of part of their job is to monitor the balance, it tells us we don't believe, we don't expect party appointed arbitrators to have the same role as the chairperson. Okay, there'd be nothing to balance if they all had exactly the same role. Okay. So I think that because party appointed arbitrators are appointed through a different process, they have actually a slightly different role than the chairperson. And therefore it follows that at least some of their ethical obligations <clears throat> might differ from those that we assign to the chairperson. Okay, And we know this is true. We actually already have rules and they're not called ethics rules. They're called procedural rules, but they are essentially ethics rules. We know that some rules are different for party appointed arbitrators. For example, when you appoint a party appointed arbitrator, I'm sure some of you do, right? You research them. Uh, you are allowed to interview them. 
Uh, it tends to be more of an American thing. It occasionally happens in Europe. Some arbitrators don't even want to do it. But under all the codes of conduct that I'm aware of, it is ethically permissible. You cannot interview a chairperson. Okay, that's essentially an ethics rule, okay, that says we differentiate between chairpersons and party appointed. Why? Because the procedure for appointing the party appointed suggests they have a slightly different role, which suggests that it's okay if they have slightly different ethical obligations. Another example is when the uh, chairperson is being chosen, the two party appointed arbitrators, typically in communication with the party who appointed them, or maybe not typically, but certainly it's permissive, it is expressly permitted in all the codes of conduct that I know for them to communicate with the party who appointed them about the appropriate chair. What do we call that in other contexts? And after the tribunal's fully constituted, we call that unethical ex parte communication. But all the ethical codes I know say that is permissible at that stage with the party appointed arbitrator. You could not have anything similar with the chairperson. One other example, again, of an ethics rule that already exists and acknowledges implicitly that there is a difference uh, in expectation and in practice for the role and conduct of chairpersons and party appointed arbitrators. The ICC has a rule, as do some other institutions, that the chairperson may not share a nationality with the, either of the two parties, okay? but the party appointed arbitrators may. Why do we not want the chairperson to share the nationality with the parties? Because there's an assumption okay, that they will be more um, uh, aligned with, they'll see the case more familiarly, it's more uh, consistently with how that party sees the case. Okay? And so we don't want to give, kind of tip the tribunal one way or the other. We want to have someone who's, and it's basically, are they going to be as impartial? if they share the nationality. Now, by distinguishing the chairpersons as, as not being able to share the same nationality, we're basically saying we have a different idea about the impartiality expected of the chairperson. Why? Because they have a slightly different role. And that's actually reflected in these procedures that we find them. Okay. And this is uncomfortable because, for a number of reasons. One, because we think the sine qua non, the actual mark of what is an arbitrator is impartiality, independence. Okay? And we always use those words. And the idea that I'm saying there is, they don't have to be, I'm not saying they don't have to be. I'm saying it's a different kind of impartiality. Okay, uh, And it's okay to acknowledge that when you have a binary rule, a, excuse me, a binary word, like impartiality, partiality, okay? that that flattens out what's otherwise a complex and nuanced concept. A concept that can accommodate two different types of impartiality. So there are a lot of contexts where we have to be impartial. And we don't usually talk about kinds of impartiality. We talk about maybe on a scale. Maybe we don't talk about it in sort of three dimensions, different kinds, okay? But I think we really can, we need to see it that way. Uh, and we can easily accommodate that. Let me give you one example, uh, which is if you have, for example, a female uh, faculty member who's the head of the so-called appointments committee, the committee that uh, hires new, uh, new um, faculty members, and she also happens to be a mother. Well, she has to be impartial as among her children. Okay? She can't, she's not supposed to. We think morally, she's not supposed to treat one favorably and one unfavorably. She's supposed to be impartial between them. But she's also supposed to be impartial as among all the applicants who apply. It's actually the same person, but they have two different types of impartiality. The reason I think we get confused in arbitration or we have a hard time accepting that is because they're all in the same tribunal, okay? Whereas the mom, academic, you know, is wearing, uh, is, is in two different contexts. But just as you can have the same person have two different ideas of impartiality, you could have uh, people on the same tribunal 
have slightly different concepts of impartiality. And the problem if we don't define that is every anything goes. Okay? If we say there's only partial and impartial, or the party appointed arbitrators are all supposed to be exactly like the chairperson, and that's not what's happening in practice, the party appointed arbitrators are criticized for not being what we in reality don't expect them to be. Okay? And they do become a farce because we have inconsistent ideas in our heads about what they're supposed to do. Okay. And I think the idea in actually in all the codes of conduct, if you look, they also say all three, all arbitrators on the tribunal must have, are bound by the same obligations of impartiality and independence. 201, all the codes say that. Okay. But as we just explored, we know that's not really true. That's not what we expect in practice. We have some the, the, some of the codes that actually allow party appointed arbitrators to speak with their appointing party and then uh, before they appoint the chair also say that they have the same ethical obligations, the exact same ethical obligations. So in other words, there's sort of a contradiction that I think comes from the discomfort in the actual words of what impartiality and independence mean. So, uh, sorry, managing the financial matters is kind of hidden on the uh, below. Um, so I would say that the chair person has a unique role, a role that is different from those of the party appointed arbitrators. And as a result, again, we might expect at least somewhat different ethical obligations. Okay. Um, so how do we say what the role is of the party appointed arbitrator? And oftentimes we, we talk about impartiality as sort of a scale. We say, well, you know, arbitrators don't have to be as impartial as judges. And party appointed arbitrators are kind of less impartial than the chairperson. Uh, but once again, I think that that is a sort of an unhelpful way to think about impartiality, but we're forced to do that because of the language. We have a scale, impartial at one end, partial at the other, okay? Uh, but we need to think about it more in a more complex way. And we also, though, uh, that doesn't sort of answer the final question. We can say, okay, well, party appointed arbitrators, because of how they're appointed, have a different uh, type of impartiality. That doesn't say it's legitimate. Okay. Um, so how do I think that the role the, the role assigned to party appointed arbitrators, which permits a somewhat different kind of impartiality, why do I think that that essentially uh, is legitimate? I think party appointed arbitrators are selected okay, to for a very specific purpose. The power to appoint is the power to determine which extra legal factors uh, will be represented in the judicators. So we have already said, that the um, that you know when when judges are appointed or arbitrators are appointed, the criteria: do we want them to be civil law or common law? Do we want them to have a background in finance? Do we want them to have practical experience in intellectual property? All of that life experience affects how they will see the case. So all those variables, all those uh, criteria we would use, I'm referring to them here as extra legal factors that essentially color. They don't render them biased or partial in the typical sense, but they certainly color the way they're going to see the case. What party want is someone who is going to see the case the way they do. Okay, and so I uh, I, I like you know because party appointed arbitrators are so besmirched, uh, they, they really are talked about more as sinners, okay, um, than as having a legitimate role. Um, but I think their sin is not that they are a farce or that they don't serve a legitimate purpose. It's really that they personify this uncomfortable tension that we as a community have not really parsed, okay? And so let me close, let me close with what I think are the truly legitimate elements uh, of a party appointed arbitrator's role. So first of all, they are a group of bulwark against group things. So we all know that arbitral decisions are not appealable on the merits. And there are a number of other reasons we can imagine. Arbitrators, when they're in a tribunal of three, have all sorts of incentives to essentially take the path of least resistance. Who appoints arbitrators? Oftentimes, <laughs> arbitrators, when they're acting as a lawyer or as a chairperson, they might be doing an appointment. Uh, arbitrators in some uh, places are, are compensated by a percentage. 
So to some extent, the more hours they invest, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, they're, they're sort of, is that a loss for them in terms of time? So they might have, and because they're reviewed, their awards are not reviewed, and because their awards are confidential, okay, they in many ways have a lot of incentives, okay, to take the path of least resistance, to throw out an easy uh, award, okay, not to scrutinize every fact, consider all the legal interpretations possible of a particular law. Uh, group think is a, is a psychological term that is uh, that has a, 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 a sociological background to explain that more in detail. But you kind of get the common sense meaning of it. I think there are a lot of incentives for them to do that. Well, who's in the best place to stop that from happening? The party appointed arbitrator who has a slightly different kind of impartiality and their impartiality includes challenging, hey, you forgot to consider this interpretation of that law, or your theory of the case doesn't make sense if you look at this fact, right? And so they act as a bulwark against essentially bad decision-making or potentially bad decision-making uh, on the tribunal. I think that's a legitimate role that they could not perform, okay, uh, and could not perform as well if they were not actually chosen by the parties because the parties think that they represent their viewpoints. They also provide representativeness on the tribunal. Now here, I don't want to confuse the idea of representation, which is what an advocate does, and representativeness. And I'm going to pause for a moment here to go to the discussion. I'm sure you'll be talking about later in the week, the proposals to eliminate uh, party-appointed arbitrators altogether, although they don't frame it that way in investment arbitration. They frame it as creating a permanent court. But remember I said the power to appoint is the power to decide what extra legal factors get considered. Who's going to appoint those judges? And will they be as representative? So when we talk about increasing diversity, one of the main things we why we want diversity in among international arbitrators is not because it looks nice or it makes us feel good or it's more fair to the arbitrators who are diverse. One of the most important justifications for it, for its need, is that parties need to be understanding that they are being evaluated, not necessarily on a specific basis, but the body of arbitrators represents the body of parties who are being adjudicated. So representativeness is incredibly important. One of the things I say about the court, when it, you know, if, it, if it does get established, uh, the opponents of it are actually uh, some smaller states in uh, less developed regions of the world. Why? Because are they going to have the same level of representativeness on a court um, as they're going to have if they get to pick one of the three arbitrators? Um, and the last, I will say, is that's very important and kind of intuitive. Once you accept this idea that the party-appointed arbitrator has this slightly off-center, let's call it, uh, way of, of acting within their role as impartial decision maker. You need a counterweight. Okay, so the other function that party appointed arbitrators legitimately do, okay, is serve as a counterweight to the other party appointed arbitrator, which in fact makes it possible for them to act as a bulwark. So I believe that party appointed arbitrators and the actual process of the party choosing them uh, allows them to provide these three important legitimate functions that make international arbitration work better. I'll close with this uh, remark because I, I, I think it ends up, we, we have a lot of built-in assumptions we don't know. One of them is you know, permanent court is good and it's oftentimes said because the judges are inherently independent, more independent, okay? Um, ad hoc tribunals, meaning arbitrations that are created for each case are bad. Okay. I think that that is something we should take a more careful look at and then a set of assumptions. Because why did the W why is the WTO not functioning right now? Because the United States wanted to be able to appoint to the appellate body a judge, one of those nice independent judges, not a party appointed judge, okay? But they blocked the whole process and shut down the entire court. Okay? Uh, and then I won't even comment about the U.S. Supreme Court on since I'm being recorded. Uh, but <laughs> let's just say the designation as a court 
um, does not insulate you from uh, some of these problems if the process for appointment um, gets hijacked. I actually think a flexible system that allows individual um, uh, appointment can be more flexible and can evolve as investment arbitration has to accommodate uh, or to fix um, on, on a, an incremental basis some of the problems that exist. So with that, um, I will just mention that the ideas for this presentation come from an article I wrote um, and couldn't be really summarized in 30 minutes. So if you're interested, I will leave you the link. You can look it up. Um, and thank you for your attention.